Yeah, so you might have noticed that all my stuff is taken down, and that's because I was filming a project here last week, and I didn't really feel like putting them back up, because I'm going to be moving in a couple of weeks anyway, so they're just down, so get used to blank white walls for the next couple videos. But now let's talk about the culmination of the Star Wars prequels that I actually think is pretty good. Revenge of the Sith. So Revenge of the Sith came out in 2005 and I vividly remember when this movie came out. I was so excited. I was seven years old and I was already a huge Star Wars fan and I couldn't wait to see Anakin Skywalker become Darth Vader. And when this movie came out, it was hands down my favorite Star Wars movie because it had the most action. You had all your favorite Jedi there. It answered the burning questions that we all had about the prequels and how they would transition it into the original trilogy. And it just happened to be the darkest and most intense of the Star Wars movies because the bad guys win this one. The heroes of this trilogy suffer some major losses and there's some legitimately sad moments. But that doesn't mean the movie's flawless. There are quite a few times when the issues that I had with the other two movies start rearing their ugly head and I'm like, ooh, yeah, that's still pretty bad. But all that considered, this movie still is the best of the three. I don't think there's really any argument about that. It does show that George Lucas was self-aware enough to sort out the good faith criticisms to try to make the movies better and the blind fan rage that these movies got smacked with when they came out. But let's get into it. So Revenge of the Sith opens over Coruscant, you know, the capital of the Republic, and it's under siege. Palpatine has been captured, the Clone Wars have been going on for several years now, and it looks like it's starting to wind down, maybe come to an end. And Anakin and Obi-Wan are tasked with rescuing the Chancellor before the ships can escape, and they never see him again. And this opening right off the bat is amazing. Starting with this really long tracking shot of Anakin and Obi-Wan's ships going into the battle and going in between the ships and shooting other ships and it's just chaos going all around. And yeah, it's all CGI, but that doesn't mean it's any less impressive. It's still a really great looking shot. And the fun just keeps going from there. They blast their way into the control ship, they get in, they infiltrate, they're running around the ship, they're slicing and dicing droids left and right. It's good Star Wars fun and it seems like Anakin and Obi-Wan are brothers, that they have this camaraderie together because Anakin's no longer a petty one. He's a full-blown Jedi Knight, so they are more or less on equal footing as far as ranking, even though Obi-Wan is technically a Jedi Master, so he does still outrank Anakin. But you definitely feel like it's more of a brotherly dynamic than a teacher-student dynamic in the last movie. And while I'm talking about these two, Hayden Christensen's acting is noticeably better in this one. He's kind of done away with that stalker teenage boy vibe that he was going for in the last one. And here he kind of reminds me of Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon a little bit. You know, he's the cop that doesn't play by the rules, he bends the rules, and sometimes he might get a little crazy and intense, but ultimately he's still a good guy. And that's kind of the energy that I get from Anakin in this movie, at least for the first half. We'll talk about the second half when he's Darth Vader later. But in this opening especially, it's a lot of fun and it's good to see him kind of loosen up. The dialogue isn't as wooden. And Ewan McGregor is just having a ball as Obi-Wan Kenobi. He has the best lines here. And he's kind of hamming it up, but he's still bringing that relatability to Obi-Wan. He still feels somewhat responsible for Anakin, but he's seeing him grow up and become his own man, and sometimes he's even proud of his accomplishments and encourages him. It's really cool to see Obi-Wan enjoying life, enjoying being a Jedi for once before all that gets taken away from him. And this opening builds up to another fight with Count Dooku, and this time Anakin and Obi-Wan are taking them together. They're more of a team, they're more of a unit working together. And it is a cool way to visualize how much better they are at working together than in the last movie. But even though the fighting is good and the death of Count Dooku is appropriately intense and an important piece of Anakin's character arc, I still feel like Count Dooku was pretty wasted in these prequels because he doesn't really get to do much. He didn't get a lot of scenes. The two scenes of him that you probably remember are him in a lightsaber fight with somebody and you just can't create that three-dimensional of a character when you're limited to lightsaber duels or just the exposition dumps that he was used for in Attack of the Clones. And I feel like this is a problem with all of the main villains in the prequels. In Phantom Menace, you had Darth Maul, didn't really do a whole lot, and then got killed. In Attack of the Clones, you had Count Dooku, didn't really do a whole lot, and he got killed at the beginning of the next movie. And here in Revenge of the Sith, we have General Grievous, who is a really cool idea for a villain, and he was done so much better in Clone Wars. No, not the Clone Wars, just Clone Wars, the 2D animated one. That is your Grievous. If you want to see General Grievous done well, 
watch that because Joe and Grievous is such a menacing presence there. And in Revenge of the Sith, he still looks cool and he's got a really cool voice and that cough is memorable, but what purpose does Joe and Grievous serve in this movie. He just kind of shuttles the Separatist leaders around from planet to planet and really only serves as the Chancellor's excuse to keep the war going. But I just think if Lucas had just focused up a bit on the villains and made Count Dooku, for instance, the villain of all three prequels and the leader of the Separatist movement and developed him into this notable enemy and this presence that you felt the whole time, even though the Emperor is still pulling the strings behind the scenes. And you could still have Darth Maul and General Grievous. I mean, they're still cool characters. I wouldn't want to cut them completely, but maybe have them be Dooku's attempts at bringing up his own apprentice to overtake the Emperor. That was an idea that was greatly developed on in both versions of the Clone Wars, take your pick. But in the movies themselves, that idea isn't really talked about or expanded on in any meaningful way. But anyway, after Anakin kills Count Dooku, Joan Grievous escapes and they're back on Coruscant safe and sound mostly. And it's here where Padme breaks the news to him that she's pregnant. And when I said that the acting is actually improved in this movie, this is the scene that I point to because the acting here between Anakin and Padme is surprisingly realistic and relatable and human. Anakin's face alone runs the gambit between worry and happiness and concern and just all the things that a Jedi in his position would think about. You feel it and likewise you feel Padme's worry and nervousness about what are they going to do with the baby once it's born? Are they going to have to run and hide somewhere? What's gonna happen. So that scene is actually a good example that George Lucas can get good performances out of his actors if he actually takes the time to work with them and motivate them and help them understand the weight of what's going on and not be so preoccupied with the VFX and technicals going on in the background. But this news that they're having a baby quickly turns sour because it's the catalyst that starts Anakin's descent into the dark side because he starts getting visions that Padme's gonna die at childbirth and he doesn't know what to do with it because it reminds him of his mother right before she died and he's not gonna let these visions become real. So he's kind of grasping for straws, trying to figure out how he can mitigate this and be the Jedi that he needs to be. Meanwhile, you've got Palpatine over here trying to corrupt Anakin, speaking some dark side voodoo into his head about helping him save Padme's life. But we can't focus too much on that because I guess the droid armies are attacking the Wookiees on Kashyyyk, so they send Yoda out to help that. And as nice as it is to finally see Kashyyyk in something other than that god-awful holiday special. Why are we there? Yeah, Yoda's an important character and he's supposed to not be on Coruscant when the really bad stuff goes down, but is anything really gained? Do we learn anything about Yoda with his time on Kashyyyk that isn't just superfluous to the narrative? I don't think so. So while all the stuff on Kashyyyk is nice to look at and it's well rendered and it's cool and it's nice to see Chewbacca always, it makes it feel a little unfocused in a movie that already has so much going on. And I feel like if Anakin and Mace Windu had more scenes together that weren't in front of the whole council, it would make the moment where Anakin finally snaps and turns to the dark side and helps the Emperor kill Mace Windu feel less forced and more natural and more earned. And let's talk about Anakin's turn for a little bit because watching all three of these movies again, Anakin's turn to the dark side isn't as sudden as a lot of people make it out to be. There's been a lot of buildup, a lot of little straws that are piled up that eventually broke the camel's back and he just snapped. So on paper, this shouldn't feel forced in any way. There was so much buildup to it. But it's the execution of it where I don't think it quite sticks the landing. And I think it's ultimately because Anakin and Mace Windu have no relationship. Every time they're in a scene together in all three movies, Mace Windu has been looking at him with judging eyes and talking down to him. And most of the time, Anakin doesn't really help himself because he'll get defensive and whiny and complain and talk back, which just makes him even more distrustful of Anakin. But just like how George Lucas showed his relationship with Obi-Wan developing over the three movies, it would have been nice to see his relationship with Mace Windu develop too, especially because, like I said in my Attack of the Clones video, Mace Windu actually taps into a little bit of dark side energy when he's in combat to get an edge on his opponents. And you think maybe that would speak to Anakin a little bit because he's very impulsive and emotional and maybe Windu could work with him through that and there could be somewhat of a relationship there. And let's talk about Mace Windu's side of the story because Mace Windu is going to confront the Chancellor who he just learned from Anakin is a Sith Lord and he's gonna go remove him from office forcibly and 
by killing him if necessary. And the Emperor uses this to sow a seed of doubt in Anakin that the Jedi want to take over, that they're corrupted, they're power hungry. And to the movie's credit, it does ask the question if in Mace Windu's final moments when he's confronting the Chancellor, if he is a little corrupted inside, that maybe that dark side that he keeps at bay is starting to take over. And when he has the Emperor dead to rights and he's about to kill him, maybe he is starting to go over to the dark side. That's an interesting idea. But the movie doesn't really go all the way with it. It just kind of stops short because that side of Mace Windu, that corruptibility, was never really addressed in the movies. And I think if that was brought to the forefront of Anakin's mind and perspective on things, he would be more justified in turning on the Jedi and believing the Emperor's lies and becoming Darth Vader. I think that would have flowed so much better. And the building blocks of it are there. They're there in the movie. I can see it. But it's just not pulled off as smoothly as it could have. But regardless, Anakin is officially Darth Vader and he has teamed up with the Emperor to wipe out all the Jedi. And the Emperor tells all the clones to execute Order 66. And they do. We get a really sad montage of all the Jedi across the galaxy being wiped out by their own troops. Most of them blindsided before they even have a chance to pull out a lightsaber. And my man, Kaede Mundi, just goes down fighting. He had his lightsaber pulled out. He fought the best he could, but he just couldn't block all of them. And he goes down. Rest in peace, Conehead. I've got your action figure in a box somewhere. Oh, while I'm talking about Jedi, I can't believe I forgot to mention Kit Fisto, my favorite Jedi ever. He's like the Aquaman of the Jedi Order in that he's aquatic and not that he's lame. Don't tell me he's... And he goes out in a really disappointing way. He's there with Mace Windu when they confront the Emperor. And to his credit, he lasted longer than the other two Jedi that just stood there and didn't really do anything. At least he kind of got a couple blocks in, but George Lucas, come on, you couldn't have done anything more dignified. You couldn't have stretched out the choreography, maybe showcased some of his skills a little bit more before you kill him. And while I'm nitpicking, I might as well talk about how Anakin contributes to Order 66, and he goes to the Jedi Temple with a bunch of clones to wipe out all the Jedi in there. And this is where I do have a serious issue because the movie tells us one thing and shows us another. And I wouldn't mind so much if it wasn't something as important and monumental as Darth Vader's first assignment. You'd think you'd want to really showcase that and show how evil he's become and his first test as a Sith Lord. And what the movie says happens is that he goes into a Jedi Temple and he wipes out all the remaining Jedi. And you can kind of assume, okay, there were some Jedi Masters that were still on the Council that they were there, and maybe some Jedi Masters that weren't on the Council, like the Librarian Lady. And so Anakin actually had to take out a bunch of Jedi Masters, and that, that was a real challenge for him, and that's why he needed the clone army backup to help him earn his stripes. But the movie doesn't show any of that. The movie only shows him walking in and taking out a bunch of younglings. And then in the aftermath, when you see the dead bodies, you only see younglings and padawans and just general children that are dead. And I think George Lucas did that so that we would hate Vader even more. You're like, oh, you're killing children. You're the baddest of the bad. You're evil, you're irredeemable. Even though you're gonna be redeemed three movies down, but he really wanted to establish that Vader is a bad dude. But by showing him only killing kids, he's not menacing, he's just a bully. And it doesn't show that there was ever any challenge for Vader, that he just wiped out all these kids and they were basically defenseless anyway. Some of them might have put up a little bit of a fight, but really none of them were ever going to match Anakin in sword play or force usage. He's just so much more powerful than them. But if you had noteworthy Jedi Masters that were there and showed that, now you can actually kind of see Vader getting better and becoming more of the Darth Vader that we know by reputation. But after all that's done, Vader's second assignment is to go to Mustafar, a volcanic planet, and wipe out even more defenseless extras in the background. You know, the Trade Federation and Separatist leaders, those guys. Actually, if you wanted to use Joan Grievous more, it would have been nice to have Joan Grievous escape Obi-Wan and go to Mustafar so that Anakin would at least have a challenge on Mustafar if you weren't going to give him a challenge at the Jedi Temple. So that, yeah, maybe he wipes out all the Trade Federation guys, no problem, but when it comes to Joan Grievous, there's a real challenge. But no, Anakin just slaughters a bunch of defenseless lizard people, no big deal. But eventually Padme goes to see Anakin to see if, like, are you okay? You seem to little weird and Obi-Wan told me that you just murdered a bunch of kids what's going on and Obi-Wan of course stowed away on her ship so now we have a big fight between Anakin and Obi-Wan master apprentice going at it battle of the heroes epic musical score fighting over volcanoes and lava and it's epic and it's awesome this is a great fight it's probably the best choreographed fight of all of Star Wars because the fighting is so intense and 
tight and fast. And you can tell that these actors practiced over and over and over again to try to get these moves right. And it shows and it's really impressive. It's impressive until it just goes a little too long. And I think I figured it out. It's when they're up on that big pillar thing that's about to go over the lava fall. That's the part that I think they could have cut. They could have just had them do the sword fighting and make it intense, have the lava start coming down and being a danger so now they have to kind of escape. Maybe just have them go straight onto those floating debris, fight a little bit, and then you get the high ground moment and that's the end. When they're up on that structure and they're swinging around and clashing lightsabers and the thing's about to fall over, that's just too much going on and it takes away from the very personal conflict between these two guys. They don't really want to fight each other but their circumstances have just brought them to completely opposite ends of the spectrum and now they're fighting. But while this is going on, Palpatine and Yoda have their own fight and it's pretty good. It's it's nice. It would have been better if this was the first time you actually saw Yoda use a lightsaber and if you want to know more about that I talked about it in my Attack of the Clones video. But for what it is I think it is a noticeable improvement on Yoda's fight in Attack of the Clones. The way they use the force is a lot more natural and the force lightning looks better and even Yoda's fight choreography is a little more grounded, less flippy and all over the place. It's a little more realistic. I know I just said realistic when you've got a fight involving a 60 something year old man and a Muppet, but this is Star Wars and this is about as close to realistic as that's gonna get. It's, it's a fine fight. I think the ending is a little weak. I wish there would have been more to actually force Yoda to retreat because as it is, it just seems like he kind of gives up. And then he tells Bill Organa that he failed. And I'm like, no, you didn't fail. You just left. You left in the middle of the fight. What, why did you stop? But it is still entertaining and thematically it is a good counterpoint to the Battle of the Heroes that I just talked about. So I can't really complain too much but after all the fighting is done everybody just kind of regroups to their corners and you have the Emperor trying to save Anakin and putting him in the Darth Vader suit and at the same time that's happening you have Padme delivering the twins, Luke and Leia, in front of Yoda and Obi-Wan and Bill Organa. And Bill Organa is willing to adopt the daughter Leia, so okay, that's where Princess Leia grew up, is with him. And the boy is given to Obi-Wan to hand off to Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru on Tatooine, and Obi-Wan agrees to watch over him. So I'm like, okay, starting to see some New Hope stuff being set up, very nice. I just wish that Padme had died of something other than a broken heart. It just seems a little too Twilight-ish for my taste. But on the other hand, you have Darth Vader finally looking and acting like Darth Vader, and it's awesome. You got this Frankenstein-inspired laboratory where he's being put together, and it looks cool until he lets out the really cringy no, and then it just kind of stops being so cool. It kind of becomes goofy. If they had just cut that scene right before he says no, it would have been a million times better and more dramatic and more serious and sad and just all the things you'd want in a Darth Vader origin story. And that's about it for Revenge of the Sith. It has its problems, but at the end of the day, it's still a really fun ride. This is what the prequels were made for. This is the kind of storytelling that I always knew George Lucas was capable of, that somewhere along the line in the first and second movies, I think his vision kind of got askew. And I feel like Revenge of the Sith is him trying to reconcile his original vision of the original trilogy with whatever his altered vision was of the prequels to try to give us something that was familiar but still new, that was still continuous. And I think he did a pretty good job with that. This definitely feels more at home in the tone and style of the original trilogy than the other two movies. So I give him full credit. But now I turn it over to you guys. What do you think about Revenge of the Sith? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And be sure to share this video to your friends because that's how the YouTube algorithm works now. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my nerdy talk. And I'll see you in the next video.